Hi, everybody. I have a reading for us this morning. It's a poem by Mary Oliver, our favorite, right? It's called Room for My Father's Ghost. Now is my father a traveler like all the bold men he talked of endlessly and with boundless admiration over the supper table? Or gazing up from his white pillow, book in his lap always, until even that grew too heavy to hold? Now is my father free of all binding fevers? Now is my father traveling where there is no road. Finally, he could not lift a hand to cover his eyes. Now he climbs to the eye of the river. He strides through the Dakotas. He disappears into the mountains. And though he looks cold and hungry as any man at the end of a questing season, he is one of them now. He cannot be stopped. Now is my father walking in the wind, sniffing the deep Pacific that begins at the end of the world, vanished from us utterly. Now is my father circling the deep forest, then turning into the last red campfire burning in the final hills where the chieftains Warriors and heroes rise and make him welcome. Recognizing under the shambles of his body a brother who has walked his thousand miles. Here ends our reading. Whenever I mention mental illness from the pulpit at First Unitarian, there's a line of folks at the door waiting to say thank you. Thank you for bringing it up. Thank you for mentioning it. Thank you for seeing me when no one else has. Sometimes I know their stories, but often I don't. They're mostly members of our community who suffer in silence, either for their own difficulties or for those difficulties of a loved one. And to be honest, I've never devoted an entire sermon to the topic before, that is, until today. In this month of vulnerability, it seems a necessary and very perfect choice. So I'm going to tell you two stories about my dad today. Both are totally true. My dad was a gentle and quiet man. He cared for his family most, like most men in the 50s and 60s did. He put on a white shirt and a bow tie, and he went to work every day. He married my mom just after the war. They were both 20. My dad served in the U.S. Navy Submarine Corps in World War II. He never talked about his war experiences. But with the GI Bill, he went to college, studied mechanical engineering, and found a job in Rochester at Haloid Xerox. That was the original copy corporation. And he was actually on the original design team of the copier 914. He even had his picture in Life magazine. I have that picture still. He was devoted to my mom, and although their relationship was sometimes challenging, he cared for her lovingly and tirelessly as she became paralyzed by MS and then later died from cancer. My dad loved to bowl and to golf. He was the treasurer at our church, and my dad loved music. Beethoven and Schumann were his favorites, and before bedtime, I could pick out an album, and we would listen to it together, and I could choose a section of the encyclopedia, and we would sit in his big chair, and we would read. He taught me to love music, to love learning, and he taught me the true meaning of devotion. And then there's story number two. My father often disappeared when we were young, for hours at a time. My mother hid a lot of his difficulties from my brother and me for decades. 
There came a time when he couldn't keep a job for very long and seemed to be burning bridges at the companies he worked for because, well, he'd take off. Sometimes he'd just go to the car to sleep. You see, I think the world was too hard for him to bear most of the time. He was a distant father, really, but most fathers were distant then. And his difficulties in the world of work made our life financially precarious and frightening. But it wasn't until my mother died in 1990 that we realized the true extent of his illness. At age 65, he became almost impossible to reach. He would disappear for days at a time. He took up with street people, giving away his belongings, his TV, his clothing, his car. He would fall in love with women who were less than stellar companions, and he was taken advantage of often. My brother and I were stunned by his behavior. He was writing thousands of dollars of checks on a joint account that he and I shared. We brought him to mental health clinics and they diagnose and prescribe medication. And he'd take the medication for a while, but ultimately he'd stop because it didn't really help and he'd end up with raging headaches and hallucinations. He withdrew further and further from his family. The lure of the streets was powerful. Ultimately, my dad was diagnosed with dissociative disorder. It's a profound mental illness that even with the best and most constant of treatments is very difficult to manage. We know now that it's often a result of trauma and linked to PTSD. For people like my dad, the illness caused him to disconnect emotionally from his world when life became too difficult. He would become emotionally shut down, and then to counter the deadened experience of that, he'd seek thrilling engagements, sometimes with drug dealers and prostitutes. Over the 20 years he lived after my mother died, my brother and I picked him up countless times from the streets, the shelters, the hospitals. We'd bring him back to our homes, set him up in a safe living arrangement, and then inevitably lose him again to the allure of the streets. <coughs> In the end, for our own safety and for that of our families, my brother and I decided to cut off contact with him. For six years, we didn't know where he was. We didn't know even if he was alive. We paid his health insurance so that if he was hurt, he could get cared for easily. We found ourselves drawn to news stories about unknown men found dead in the streets of Rochester in the case that it might be him. And let me say, I loved my dad, and so did my brother. We were exasperated. There was little or no help from the medical system and or from the legal system. We sought all possibilities. And in the end, tough love seemed like the only option, and it was heart-wrenching. Now, I've been a member of the Rochester Unitarian Congregation for more than 25 years, and I can guarantee you there is no more than a handful of people who know my story. Maybe I was silent about this personal, personal struggle because I really desperately wanted to believe story number one. I wanted to join in others' conversations about their relationship with their parents, that focused on love and caring and shared experiences. I think that was part of it. But I also think I was ashamed of this. I know I was ashamed of this. I was ashamed of who he was, of how he behaved, and maybe most of all, I was ashamed that I couldn't fix it. Me, Tina. I was the director of mental health counseling during this time for two agencies in Rochester. I had the best connections. I had resources at my fingertips, and I could not fix this. I was angry most of the time. My heart was aching, and nothing I did could solve this problem. I was totally vulnerable and lost. <clears throat> 
And so, my story was untold. Now, I'm sharing it here today, and I shared it last week at First Unitarian, because I don't think that my story is all that rare. Somebody's so upset. <laughs> I felt that way sometimes. <laughs> The details of my story might be more extreme, but you know what, maybe not. There are many people in our communities that live with mental illness or they're caring for someone who is ill and these people struggle every day and most often they do it in silence. We do not share their troubles in our caring notes. When a member is suffering from depression and hasn't been able to leave their home for a week, we don't ask for prayers at Joys and Sorrows. No one brings meals. They either come to me or to Reverend Karen or Sarah and share their story, their frightening story in confidence because they're afraid someone might find out, even their closest friends. You see, this is an illness of shame and silence and it's so ingrained in our culture that it's almost impossible to break through. Here's some statistics. In the general population, in any given year, 26% of individuals 18 and older will have a diagnosable mental disorder. Baylor University did a research study of churches and found that in a variety of Protestant churches across four denominations, they studied 6,000 individuals, that the percentage is actually higher, almost 28% report that they or a family member suffered from mental illness during the previous year. And those families who care for the mentally ill loved one, well, they report that they have significantly more relationship struggles and financial problems, and they have an increased difficulty connecting to their church. If we translate that into our community, it means that at least a quarter of the families in this congregation, maybe even in this room, are struggling to manage this silent demon on a daily basis. <coughs> a few weeks ago, Reverend Karen talked about shame as the experience of being fundamentally flawed. You see, shame is not recognizing that we have done something wrong, but that we are wrong. It's this kind of shame and stigma that's influenced our perception and treatment of individuals suffering from mental illness for centuries. And it's so insidious. If I'm honest about the shame I felt around my father's illness, it was that no matter what I did, he chose his illness and his life on the streets over me. I offered him a loving family support and care, and he turned away and chose strangers. One time I took him home from the hospital after he had surgery from a fall in the street. He told me about the love and the compassion of the people in the hospital, the people in the shelters, but he forgot to say thank you to my brother or myself. And before long, he left our home and went back to his life that was dangerous and frightening. I could listen to my friends who were psychologists explain his behavior. I could intellectually understand the constraints of his illness, but somehow I believed if I loved him enough, I could break through his tortured mind, I could bring him home for good, I could fix him, love could fix him. It's such a dangerous way to think, really. Imagine for a moment if my dad had cancer, I would certainly not think I could cure his illness by loving him. We understand physical maladies require treatment, yet we put mental illness into a different category altogether rather than seeing it as a biological dysfunction, even today. We view it as a character flaw that can be overcome with strength of will. If you're depressed, well, just go outside. Maybe not today. <laughs> Exercise, you'll feel better, right? If you're anxious, well, relax. There's, there's nothing to worry about. 
You're overreacting. See, we minimize the suffering of millions of people every day. And the illnesses identified under the category of mental disorders are as a common malady as any. <clears throat> Depression, anxiety, addiction are just as prevalent in our population as heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. I don't know many people who are ashamed of getting cancer, but most are ashamed and silent about their mental illness. And frankly, there are good reasons. Several years ago now, two men walked into an emergency department of a New York City hospital complaining of chest pain. One is immediately surrounded by specialists. He's rushed to the cardiac care unit. He receives emergency surgery. His insurance bill pays for his care, and he's followed by specialists for months. The other man sits in the waiting room for hours before seeing anyone. He's finally examined by a nurse and told to go home, call the behavioral clinic in the morning for an appointment. Insurance does not pay for his emergency visit, and the clinic cannot see him for two weeks. Both men had a heart attack. The difference was that the second also had a history of anxiety disorder and panic attacks. The second man died within a week of his emergency visit. We have a law in this state, in this country, that requires insurance companies to cover expenses for mental illness at the same financial level as expenses for physical illnesses. The fact that these are still differentiated is a huge puzzle to me, as all mental illnesses have biological components and vice versa. The law is called the Mental Health Parity Act of 1996. That's a long time ago. But it was just last week that MVP Healthcare, the second largest provider in Rochester area, was being investigated by the State Attorney General's Office for issuing 40% more denials for behavioral health claims than for medical claims. Now, they have already agreed to pay a fine, a civil fine of $300,000, but this review by the Attorney General's office could result in more than $6 million being returned to MVP members. That's a lot of unnecessary pain and denial. The shame and stigma experienced by people and families living with mental illness are reinforced and even internalized when society is, treats us differently because of our disorders. And so we are silent and allies for our cause are scarce. Now, the Baylor University study that I mentioned earlier, people su suffering from anxiety and depression will reach out to their church first before seeking help from a professional counselor. So they walk in the door. Traditionally, churches have approached mental disorders as a spiritual failing, a lack of faith or personal sin rather than something that needed support and understanding. Now, while we Unitarian Universalists can look at this and know that it is wrong and misdirected, empathy and compassion for those living with mental illness is still challenging for many congregations. I think that's because it requires that we look at our own vulnerability. You see, we rely on our capacity to think clearly, to navigate this complex society. We use our rational thought process to respond to life's demands and build our relationships. The experience of having illness that takes away our ability to discern reality is terrifying for all of us. And if we don't know how to help, what to say, or how to respond with, to someone who is, who is suffering, we stifle our efforts. And yet mental illness is more treatable now than ever before through a combination of medication and a variety of treatment modalities. Individuals can regain their health and lead loving and productive lives. There is, however, a strong link between the success of treatment and a person's community involvement.
Those with financial resources and a strong support of circle of friends and family, well, they can afford to be proactive and seek help before a crisis. Individuals without resources or who have distanced themselves from their communities and families, well, they often cycle through clinics and emergency rooms and unfortunately the criminal justice system as well. And it begs, this begs for a way to heal the shame. As a daughter of a man with mental illness, I felt shame. But I believe my dad did as well. <clears throat> shame and guilt that he could not live up to our expectations. I expected him to make a choice. I'm not sure that was even possible for him. You see, the street people, well, they knew him, they knew his story, and they accepted him just as he was. I wanted him to change. I wanted the father in my first story. I wanted a different ending. I believe the only way to heal this kind of shame is to shine light on it. I believe we hold and are able to hold the emotions of anger and sorrow and guilt and love all at the same time. We do this best, I think, when we share our stories, all of them, the one with happy endings and the ones without. You see, sharing our stories takes the secrecy away. It normalizes our experience. We find others who have similar stories our experience moves from a secret that has a raging power to distort our hearts to a shared burden, to a shared truth. The title of my sermon today, Safe Harbor, Holy Rest, and Peace at Last, is the epitaph on my dad's gravestone. It's the ending of a prayer for sailors who are lost at sea. After six years of not knowing where my dad was, a phone call came from a rather tenacious social worker at the Wesley community. Dad had fallen and fractured his pelvis and he gave them my number to call. By then he was in his 80s, he was very frail, and life on the street had left him mostly blind and hard of hearing. I have to say that living without contact was not easy. I second guess my choices all the time. I am not a person who abandons my loved ones, yet I did. My brother and I would reconsider our action each time we got word from a social worker or a shelter or a hospital. But all we had ever done had never made a difference and I was scared and I was lost. And when this last invitation came, I was cautious and angry and so very tired of this struggle. And my dad, well, he was tired of the street. By this time, I was in seminary, and I had worked with a counselor myself over all of these years. And I knew that if I chose to walk toward my dad this last time, I would have to find a way to forgive him. Not for being sick. No, never for being sick but for not being the dad I wanted him to be, the dad in story number one. But most of all, I realized I would have to forgive myself for not being able to fix him. It seemed the only option I had available. It was the only thing I had not tried. After dad's fracture healed, we moved him into an assisted living facility my brother and I had him back. For three years, we worked to rebuild our relationship. It was very slow and guarded for both of us. He talked about the streets and his friends, and I understood that he loved them and missed them and that they loved him too. And I understood how hard it must have been for him every time my brother and I stood with our open arms and asked him to choose to come home. Together we listened to music again. His grandchildren got to know him. When I was ordained, he called me Rev Honey. <laughs> we voted for President Obama together. <laughs> 
When he died four years ago last week, my brother and I were by his side. There are so many things I did wrong over the years that we battled, but in the end, I think through the help of my husband and my family and a small circle of friends, I learned how to love an imperfect man with my imperfect self. And I miss him. So this is a small church community, but I have to say you are strong and vibrant and mighty. You have deep concern for one another. I can see it in the way that you care for each other when I come to preach. I can see it in my Soul Matters group. We all have the capacity to make a difference in the lives of our members who struggle. But first, we have to be open to knowing them in a different way, open to knowing their vulnerability and their stories. We must share our stories about mental illness and be willing to share the burden in our community of those who are suffering in silence. So I ask you today to stand with me. And, we've, and together we will find a way to reach out, to open our hearts, to stop the silence, and to heal the shame. Together we can create the safe harbor, the holy rest, and peace at last. Thank you. May it be so. And amen. Please grab a hand if you can as we extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Join us for worship every Sunday at 10 a.m. at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Canandaigua, a welcoming congregation. We are located at 3024 Cooley Road, four miles west of South Main Street, Canandaigua, just north of the intersection with routes 5 and 20. Look for the blue signs just before the turn. Your comments about this program or questions about the church are welcome at 585 three nine six one three seven O or at our website www.canandaguauu.org. dot org producer and editor Daniel Brigham <laughs>